Um, so anyway, thank you everyone for joining. I'm Paul Balog. I'm the uh, steering committee uh, member here. And then uh, John, I guess he didn't show up. I'm getting really tired of this. My, uh, my co-organizers are never showing up. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, anyway, but yeah, so I work for Grafana Labs and I am the local CNCF ambassador for the, I guess you could say for the area since I'm the only one in the area, I think. Um, but anyway, we'll go through here and I just want to start off, yeah, with some housekeeping here. Please do spread the word. Um, you know, if you're on Twitter, whatever, follow us at STL Go Meetup. Um, you know, please do like, you know, tweet out, um, use the hashtags there. Uh, all that kind of stuff helps. Take pictures, post them. Uh, that, you know, that's kind of nice for my ego. And it might be nice for James's ego. Uh, get some uh, good, good uh, promotions about that stuff. And then, of course, like the video and, you know, or wait, you're supposed to smash the subscribe or like, click subscribe, smash the like button. It's like, yeah, and then the kick the notify bell, right? So, um, and yeah, give us feedback. You know, we suck. Please be uh, constructive and let me know. <laughs> All volunteers and we just want to better the community. Please do get involved. If there's any kind of topics or things you'd like to see researched and talked about, you know, please do go to our GitHub and then, uh, you know, pop in the, in the chats there. Also, just as a heads up, this is for the, uh, the Kubernetes group. CNCF prefers that we go migrate over to their Bevy platform that they use. So we'll be doing that. I'm going to be, still be cross-posting for meetup.com um, until there's charges. And then uh, once they start charging, then I'll, I'll have to cut that out. But definitely go to community CNCF IO St. Louis, all spelled out. Um, and then uh, that way then you can RSVP and get all the notifications and everything like that. But uh, we'll still do this, the, the same live streams. That won't change. So sponsors, CNCF, thank you for covering the hosting fees and uh, the food they'll be paying for that. And then uh, OCI for hosting the facilities because, uh, you know, previously we were over at uh, Cortex, which was nice, but uh, it was a much smaller venue as far as the uh, meeting rooms go. But uh, it was much more hip, though. It was very hip. So, but anyway, friends and partners, we got the, the Go Meetup, Grafana and Friends, Dev Como, uh, the GoBridge uh, community and Go Developer Network. We're all kind of like, tied together and sharing this stuff. And then, yeah, coming up soon, the Mo Reliability Meetup group. So we're going to try to target developers, QA folks, uh, site reliability engineers, all that good stuff. We're going to start some stuff in October. Um, so that'll be a new meetup group. And then hopefully have that one go through meeting in, uh, you know, here in St. Louis but also in Columbia, Missouri, and then also Kansas City, possibly. And who knows, maybe maybe somewhere that's not on I-70. So um, anyway, but yeah, so coming up, KCD, uh, the Kubernetes Community Days will be coming up in Washington, D.C. So if you want to, if you're interested in going and attending that, um, that's the only one U.S.-based uh, that's remaining for this year. And then KubeCon will be coming up in November. Um, please do use the, uh, if you're interested in going, you can get the 15% off using my, uh, my code there. Um, real secret code. So it's, it's kind of blatantly obvious, uh, one there to use, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, go ahead and sign up for that. I'll be there actually. And I'll be, uh, working the partially in the Grafana booth and I don't know yet to see if I, my talk got uh, accepted. So we'll find out, but, uh, anyway. So I don't keep babbling on. Is there anything anybody else wants to bring up? Any openings that uh, people are looking for hires or, or whatnot? Now's a good time, no? All right, hearing none, we will go on and I'll hand it over to James. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> it's good to be back in St. Louis. <laughs> All right, here, I'm going to, should be a quick switch over and easy here. So 
I now have your slides on the live oh, stream, so you just need to share it here. Oh, and helps if I give you the HDMI. There you go. All right, we good to go? You just run with it and can speak loudly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll just uh, okay. Yeah, just just let me just ask me to speak up if I'm not loud enough. I'll just go over and with it. So welcome everyone. To today's meetup. I was just gonna go over Open Future. I recently discovered Open Future. I started contributing a little bit to it, and I thought it'd be really awesome just kind of share what it is. Um, you know how it could be useful, and like why I think it's really really important. To kind of like help it establish a level of maturity as well as like would provide a lot of benefit to projects. And um, so a little bit about myself. My name is James Carr. Uh, I'm uh, currently doing like fractional CTO work for various companies. I, um, I've been an engineer for almost 20 years now. I've been in management for six. But, uh, you know, I'm really passionate about distributed systems and continuous delivery. That's going to be a lot of what I'm talking about future flagging today is that, you know, it just, it's a, whole, a big accelerator for continuous delivery. And usually I have like my Twitter and socials here. I just put my personal website from there. If you want to talk to me on Twitter, if you want to leave comments about Kubernetes on Instagram, feel free to like look me up. I try to post more content out there recently, so. So today, it's kind of funny. I started putting this uh, presentation together, and I was going to all of these code samples using like Open Feature and how Open Feature works. And it's like, oh, wait a second, maybe we should go back and spend more time talking about feature flagging in general, because not everybody uses feature flags. And even then, there's a lot of things within feature flags that you know could be new to a lot of people. So I decided to really kind of shift the focus a bit. I want to spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, deployment strategies, using feature flags, things like that. And then we'll kind of go into open feature and I'll give a good overview of the ecosystem, uh, what it is, how you can use it. And then finally from there, we'll just kind of like summary. I'll do like, I don't do live demos anymore just because I've been burned way too many times. So I'll provide links to like things that can let you do your own live demos. <laughs> um, so quick, quick question. How many of you have actually used feature flags in production today? We got two people, maybe three. Um, so a couple of things I want to go into before I kind of dive into it is the way that companies, they, they, people classically divide the, um, the software development life cycles. You have like what's called sort of like day zero, day one, day two activities, right? And he has like day one, you're doing development, deployment. Day two is maintenance, monitoring, optimization. Um, it doesn't really work like that too much anymore, in my opinion. A lot of times you're like, those things work hand in hand, right? You're deploying and you're observing your changes as they go out. You're monitoring error thresholds and kind of like optimizing it. So with feature flags, you're really kind of combining day one, day two activities. Uh, now deployment strategies is the big thing I want to cover as part of this though. There's a lot of different ways you could do deployments, right? Like for example, uh, the most classical one is you just recreate it, right? You just, maybe you put up like some kind of web page, you uh, deploy version two, and then you direct traffic to the new version of the web application. It's a pretty straightforward shotgun approach. Uh, I remember there's a lot of websites where you'll see they might have a 504 at some point during the day, and it turns out that's because of the time when they did their deployment, right? They don't really have any kind of graceful way of handling it. This is like, the pro for this though is it's pretty simple to get off the ground. It's pretty easy. You just deploy to your servers and traffic routes to it. It works at a small scale, it's good enough. Like you don't really have like a lot of problems with it until you like try to do like more large scale type activities. Um, the downsides to it though are pretty obvious. You're gonna have some users who are gonna get errors. There's gonna be some inconsistencies as traffic switches over. It's going to be pretty expensive if you have to redeploy, if you have to do like a redeployment or a rollback. Like if version two of your app is like spinning out 500s and it's down, then you're going to have to do another deploy to either roll it back to version one or some other mechanism. And there's going to be like a significant amount of downtime. 
Sure. approach i think the biggest con there is the, the biggest pro is that you're shifting traffic gradually versus again a big bang the downside to it though is that um you're gonna have some users in a bad state if you have, if there's like a mishap or you have to roll back um, of course blue green is the other one that's pretty popular and that is the idea is that you have like version two and you deploy version two side by side with version one Right. And at that point, what's kind of nice is the load balancer is basically doing a lot of the routing for you. So you have everybody looking at version one, you bring up version two, and then you just switch traffic over to version two. And if there's anything wrong, if error rates are like really high or anything like that, you just switch everything back because the old stack's still running. You don't have to like do a redeployment anymore. Like you don't have to have a rollback and just like redeploy it just automatically, you know, just point everything back to it. It's fine. Uh, Plus and minuses, you don't get that gradual ramp up, right? Because now if you're just doing a blue-green deploy, you're just swapping everybody over to the new one. So you're going to get an instant surge. So some people typically use a combination. Like I've used blue-green deployments in the past. We've always done like a gradual shift. Like we bring version 2 up, and then we ramp deploy. Percentage is over, right? Uh, the other one is Canary, and that's, that's pretty much what I was just talking about, right? Like you bring up that version two and you just shift like a percentage of traffic over until you get to 100%. And this is what I had classically done during my final days of Zapier and during my time at Reify Health as well. Uh, and this is pretty, pretty popular because you have version two up, you route like 10% of traffic to it and you can discover, oh, there's a major defect. Just switch everything back to version one. It's a lot safer, not a lot of people are exposed to a blast radius. Um, there's a lot of different systems out there that automate this for you. I think you can use like, they'll like kind of like monitor air thresholds and just automatically back out and go back to the very first version if there's issues with it. Um, the downsides to this, as, as traffic ramps up, you can start having some issues start becoming more obvious. Like I've had uh, deployments like this where everything's fine until it reaches a tipping point, like 50 or 60 percent. At that point, the surge in traffic um, causes like database overload or there's a performance issue. Something, uh, something happened there. I think the biggest thing that comes into play when you run two stacks side by side, um, in any case, any kind of situation, is that you're going to have. Um, double the resources. So you got double the cloud spend. You got, um, you know, a lot of different things. Even if you use auto scaling group and you kind of scale that out or, or, you know, your pods are scaling out in version two, there's still a lot of resource contention that can happen during that period. Um, like something I ran into a lot of when I did something like this is that the database would come under extreme pressure during a deployment because during a deployment, you have pods like expanding out and scaling out and then you have the R1 scaling down. During that period, your connections basically double. Um, and then you have A-B testing. A-B testing, like a lot of us have done this even before feature flagging days, right? Where, you know, users are reaching with a different device or they have some kind of different heuristics. They get routed to different versions of the app that are being deployed. Um, and so that's like something you might use as part of a deployment strategy as well, where you're like, Certain users get one version of the app, other users get a different version of the app.
So feature flags, you've, you've probably done feature toggles in some form. Like we only had two people raise their hands, but I'm pretty sure everyone's done a situation, at least at some point, where they say, hey, if, if this thing is true, then you want to do this other thing, do this thing, or otherwise do this other thing, right? Uh, it's pretty much feature flagging. It's bare minimum. They call, it, this, they call this static feature flag, which means like you're like hard coded within your application, some kind of criteria, and then you like have it execute two different paths based on that criteria. Um, perfect example of this from my past uh, life. When I was at Carfax and I was working on a team that was responsible for how they rendered the vehicle history reports. We wanted to release a new feature that was going to be developed over a prolonged period of time. And so what we did was we basically just had within the main, uh, gosh, what was it, Struts 1, I think? Like within the Struts 1 controller, there was basically an FLS statement, an FLS statement, and basically it um, inspected the session data compared to like what we were saying, who gets the new report, and then it would say, go execute this strategy that generates this new report, otherwise generate the old report. Um, so, you know, I mean, a lot of us have done this throughout the years. It's not new. Um, but there's different kinds of feature toggles that you can kind of implement, right? There's a, like, this is a static example, or you might have a dynamic example as well. Like maybe you've, um, maybe you've worked on a project where there will be like a lookup table of sorts, and then that lookup table basically will get evaluated and determine whether or not to, um, utilize certain features or make certain things present. So, but you have, you have stack ones, those are kind of built to your code. And you have dynamic ones that are more dynamic. They're being like generated from some kind of data source, whether it's a flat file, API, thing like that. Uh, and then you're gonna have, there's four different types of feature toggles. So there's um, what's called a release toggle. That's just what I was talking about earlier and the fact that you have something that you wanna test it in production but you don't want to release it to everybody. You know, release toggle basically is for unfinished features that can just be, you can merge them into main, you can deploy them, and then you can toggle them on for specific people. Like maybe you just toggle it for yourself, maybe you toggle it for your team, um, you know, things like that. And sorry, I, I didn't realize I was moving, I wasn't moving this, this stream, <laughs> this stream uh, slides with these slides, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Something always happens with the live stream. That's all right. Oh, <laughs> uh, no worries. So, uh, so yeah. So these are for like when you want to release something, right? Like uh, the biggest, the biggest area where I find release toggles immensely useful is you have a feature that you're working on. You can turn it on for yourself, your team. You all can actually use it in production. And this doesn't mean you skip staging, you know, skip lower environments. It just allows you to really test production, test like a lot of things that are really hard to replicate. They aren't cheap to replicate in, production, in staging. And then you can even like turn it on for beta users. Like um, maybe you have people sign up for beta features, they basically get those features now whenever they're up there, they're enabled for beta people. And then when, when you want to release it to actual end users, you can like release it to specific groups, 10%, 20%, no deployments change at that point. You're just configure, changing the configuration of who gets to see those features, right? And then another really popular one is experiment toggles. So experiment toggles is really basically just to route users dynamically for data-driven A-B testing. Um, simplest one we used to have back in the day is you just do a module of the session ID and get them like one page or the other, see which one converts the most over time, right? Um, experimental toggles still exist, no matter like what kind of backend you use. And then we have operations toggles. So those are like times where you have toggles that are basically designed to, you know, help you control system behavior performance and allow you to test like different like new like features that um, they're not necessarily features, but they're performance improvements or ways to kind of like refine optimize things a bit. And then lastly is permission toggles. That's when you're customizing features and experiences just for specific user groups. Uh, I think you see this a lot when you have large, large users in your, in your system. They tend to get like special features developed just for their use cases or just for like, for example, you might have like a lot of different classes of users. Maybe one of them is for pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals get very specific um, treatment for compliance reasons, right? 
So I found this online. I was looking back over the Martin Fowler feature flag um, article on the martinfowler.com. And I thought this was a really useful, useful visual to steal and reshare. And this basically just kind of shows like the different kinds of toggles that you typically have. And, you know, the difference between like how dynamic they are and how um, long lived they are. And as you can see, release toggles typically, you know, fit within the, the, the magnitude of days and weeks, maybe close to a month, but those are almost always like related to feature development, getting a new feature out. So those live until they get to 100%, then you delete them, no problem. Uh, operation toggles, those tend to be a lot more long-lived. And the reason I say that is because um, a lot of times ops toggles, like they, you might be like, trying to improve performance of your application in some sense. They also might exist to buy, apply back pressure as well. Like a very popular example is uh, that I, I, from my own personal history, is we used a lot of RabbitMQ, a lot um, for basically executing end user tasks on Zapier. And um, if, if RabbitMQ started becoming even pressure, we didn't want to get hammered with more and more publishers. So basically like there was like a switch that we had that was in our system we were using at the time where if you toggled it, it instead of putting those in the rabbit, it just buffer them up into SQS or S3 and then replay those over time. So it's just like a way to apply back pressure if like a certain resource has become constrained, then you can just say, hey, toggle this, shift 15% of users to this other resource, or something like that. This other database, this other read replica, there's a lot of different things you can do with that. And those, I feel that those tend to like sit out there forever. Like I guarantee you, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of like systems out there with toggles that you know, they, they stop directing data to a queue and it puts it somewhere else to be reprocessed later. Those, those just tend to live forever. Um, and as we get further out, you also see that they get more, a lot more dynamic too. Like for experiment toggles, those are gonna be on like various different attributes of users, requests, there's a lot of different variables that would be in place. Same thing with permissions. Also, it's a great article to read, by the way. Um, all right, so a little bit about implementation details. Um, when it comes to feature flagging, I think do-it-yourself in the past is definitely popular. Uh, like I said, a lot of people use feature flags and don't even realize it. Um, I think as early as 2008, 2007, I worked on projects that have a lookup table in Oracle, and then like, different things will happen based on the values of that lookup table. And then each user is basically had like metadata that was compared with that lookup table. And so it's like, there's a lot of ways to do it yourself. Um, maybe you have stack configuration files as well. That's one way you might have feature flags. Or you might use like a different framework. Um, it's open source, like Gargile. Gargile, I used it back in the Django days on Django. And uh, it's a feature flag framework. Basically use MySQL as a backend, allow you to control feature flags from the admin panel. Uh, what's a lot more popular these days, though, is uh, a hosted solution like LaunchDarkly, Dynatrace, um, Tapolytic Split. You know, there's there's dozens of them. I'm not going to be able to list them all. Uh, I personally used LaunchDarkly previously, um, and I used it quite a lot. But I think the other ones are worth like checking out as well. Uh, so the way this typically works, right, that's typically what you see for like, you know, within your application, you have different features and you're going to basically use the feature flag to provider to get those feature flags and determine whether things are enabled, disabled. There's a lot of different things you might do there. Like you might cache your flags and time have them expire and like refetch from the provider. But the big thing, the, the key feature here is you have some kind of provider and then your application is just using that feature flag provider to evaluate future flags, retrieve them, those kind of things. So that's the dig, that's the dig, big dig down into future flags. Before we go to open future, are there any questions about future flags that people might have or might be curious about? All right, oh, go ahead. Um, you'll have to pardon me. I don't know what a good definition of a future flag or a future flag is. 
Uh, can you relay that? Uh, to define a, uh, what a feature flag actually is. Yeah, it's a feature flag is really just, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm not, I like drawing that. A feature flag is really just like something that specifies a value that you're evaluating against. Um, it's, it's really all it is. It could be as simple as a Boolean. You say, hey, is this enabled? And you pass like some data for it, like this user, things like that, and it'll return whether or not it's enabled or not. So I think it's like a feature flag is really just like, there's two things there, right? There's like the, the actual key, what's, what's the feature flag bot key? And then about, it's just a key value basically. But then there's also an evaluation context. So it's a couple of some sort. What, what, what context are you using? Is it, is it being used as a, as a CI/CD thing, or is it being used as source code control, or what? How's it being used? Yeah, your your system still isn't. Needed. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, or if you can reduce the volume on yours on your laptop. Oh, okay. That's causing the feedback. I, I guess I'm missing the context of how 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 a feature flag is being used or implemented. If you get to that, then I'll I'll, I'll, I'll just sit back and just get this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I mean, how? Because it's you're usually using a feature flag just to uh, like gate, you know, access gate uh, functionality, right? So if uh, you know you want, uh, I don't know, uh, algorithm two, you know, if they're a special user or yeah. something, okay. you know, that type of a thing. So you're you're forking traffic along there. You know, yep. Based on exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this might be kind of a simplistic question, but the question is, you know, till now we saw if then... So far. So the question is more, uh, why do we need to Because we saw that if that is, you would have to know, one versus the other, like one version versus the other, or one, one feature in a version versus seems like they're all conditional stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so why do you need something like a f open feature SDK? That is yeah, I'll get into that next. Yeah, I think the big thing there is like the the reason like you might want to get into something like an SDK, like open feature, is that open feature really provides like.
Check, check, check. All right. Let me finish this off. All right. Now we should be back. Should have audio again. All right. Boom. So, yes, I come bearing gifts today. So, as I mentioned, I'm cleaning out my closets from uh, all this swag that I've had, that I've accumulated over, over the years. And I think... I don't know, I think I mentioned earlier that uh, I had in my past been a Linkerd contributor. So I have a couple couple Linkerd caps to give out. So if anybody's interested in a Linkerd cap, I also have a couple Linkerd t-shirts here, a large and uh, an XL. So we got those. Um, thanks to Linkerd folks. I've also got some of their stickers too. So <laughs> I was actually kind of saving them because I thought, okay, one of these days I'll do a talk on Linkerd because I love Linkerd, <laughs> um, but they don't hire me. But anyway, but yeah, so next month, the Kubernetes group, uh, our normal date will be August 15th. Well, semi-normal because it's going to be on a Tuesday. It's my partner. It's her, uh, her birthday on the 17th, so I'd be in really big trouble if I did a uh, meetup instead. So we're going to do it on uh, the Tuesday. Tentatively, it's me speaking. Um, and I just came up with this title today and like, you know, it's like, oh, I got to put something together. So maybe we'll do L is for logging and we can talk about the, all kinds of different, uh, different things there. Um, but yeah, so that... <laughs> Don't give away the secret, you know, <laughs> but yeah, that is, <laughs> but yeah, that is one of the things. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> since Vinod is kind of giving away the secret, uh, yeah. So with uh, Grafana Labs, we have, uh, we, we kind of uh, tied onto the whole LGTM, you know, the looks good to me thing. Um, so we have L for logging, which is a product that we have called Loki. But then I wouldn't, I, if you know me well enough, you know I'm not going to make it a total commercial. So I uh, only push the open source with Grafana. But uh, so I could talk about logs.io uh, even or anything like that. But, uh, but yeah, but with Grafana, we had the LGTM. So L for logging. Uh, G is for the graphs for the UI. Uh, T is for traces, uh, tempo, we have a product there. And then uh, the M is for uh, metrics, which is Mimir. So anyway, but yeah, so we had the whole LGTM stack. So anyway, I figured I'll, uh, I can give a little talk on that if uh, need be. Unless somebody else comes up with something stellar that they would like to talk about, which I would welcome. Uh, I'm uh, no, that's not sounding familiar offhand. So Stanza is the uh, logging solution that is, uh, oh. L is for logging. All right, yeah. So, so Stanza, so that can, comes from the Observe IG. Uh -huh. And uh, they have contributed, and they, it is going to be the logging engine inside the telemetry. For the, all the open telemetry? No. Oh. Very cool. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, yeah, because all I'm always looking for speakers, so you know. <laughs> Stanza, exactly. Yeah, no, that's that would be nice. Um, but yeah, uh, and so nothing has been planned, but the Go Lang meetup group, uh, the normal schedule would have us meeting next Thursday, so a week from today. Um, don't have a speaker. I was thinking about throwing something together. Um, I might be able to put something together in like a week, um, but uh, give you an idea of what I'm thinking about is uh, one of the things with the, uh, the Go uh, programming community, uh, they had a big survey not too long ago. And then uh, one of the things that people were really interested in learning about was uh, web frameworks for Go. 
So anyway, there is a project called Push Up, which, uh, to be honest, it on first on first sight, I was looking through it a little bit. It's very reminiscent of JSPs. If uh, for anybody in the Java land, you know, but or PHP, it could be too. But uh, but yeah. So anyway, it's one of those things. It's like oh, okay, you know, let's give it a try. Uh, you know, kind of go through it. It might not be too bad. Uh, and at least play around and see what it's all about. But, uh, you know, I don't know how, how great it is or anything, but uh, I'll give it a shot. So I'll play around with something like that, and then I can put that together and then uh, talk about it next week. Um, so, but yeah, so if you're not a member of the Golang uh, meetup group, please do sign up for that. Um, and like I said before, please do go sign up for the, the CNCF community group for St. Louis. And then, uh, because we will ultimately migrate over that way. And that is all I got. So please take some pizza. I can't, I can't take all that home with me. I'm trying to uh, lose some LBs. I you might, you might notice that uh, this thing's a little tight, but, uh, yeah, no. So, uh, anyway, but yeah, please help yourself. A little bit of swag, lose, lighten up my load to take back. So. Anyway, thank you everybody for showing up.